It is my pleasure uh, to be introducing Dr. Michael Trotter, who is currently with Delta Regional Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery in Green Greenville, Mississippi. Now, if Dr. Trotter looks familiar to some of you, there's good reason for that, because after receiving his medical degree from Wake Forest, he came to UAB for postgraduate training in surgery uh, between 1981-1987. Today he has more than 20 years practical experience in the field and is the lead author of papers too numerous to mention here. The presentation we're about to hear today coincides uh, nicely with the publication of his paper on today's topic in The American Surgeon, which will appear, I'm told, in just a few months in December, the December issue. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Michael Trotter as he speaks on the maturation of a specialty the evolution of vascular surgery at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's a real pleasure to be back here. Uh, it's been quite a few years since I've been back and, and certainly to spend any time here. And I really want to thank Mike and Tim for providing an opportunity for me to uh, come deliver this presentation. It was an outgrowth of a project that I had an idea of years ago, uh, but you get busy, and before you know it, it's been 25 years, and nothing's been done about it. And as you get a little bit older, you have a little bit more time to uh, look at some of these questions. And, and as I looked at this question and the, the, the people involved, it, the story crafted itself very nicely. Uh, but when you write stuff, uh, and I'm, I, I certainly have no big experience in it, but if I were to ever uh, write a book and then somebody asked me, do you want to make a movie out of it, I said, you bet. How much is that going to get me? So when you write stuff, if somebody asked you to uh, see it visually before it's, it comes out in publication, that's a, that's a no-brainer. You say yes automatically. So y'all are going to get to see the movie and then whoever's interested uh, can read the article in a couple of months. That's the book. This is a, a little paper we I put together uh, that's going to come out of the American Surgeon uh, in December. My perspective on all of this is simply one of uh, <clears throat> kind of a, a, a history buff, and I uh, am involved in the Alumni Association at the Oxford Clinic, uh, which is where I did my cardiovascular training. And we have a little historical vignette that comes out in the journal uh, every uh, quarterly, and I had put together a little uh, paper on Champ Lines a couple of years ago, and then it was a matter of an idea of Champ having operated on a family member, uh, and then having gone through uh, long experience with Holt McDowell, uh, and then seeing the effects of, of what that did to my close relative, it was just kind of a no-brainer to connect the dots, but the main thing about it is that it was just simply interesting and fun. Uh, so I hope you enjoy uh, some of this information and find it interesting. When we look at vascular surgery in the South and we talk about it from a historical standpoint, obviously you see a lot of people uh, have written about it. Many of you have probably read these articles. Alton Oxford, David Savison, Mike DeBakey, Norman Rich, Jesse Thompson, Dan Cooley, uh, all of which, all of whose stories uh, make for interesting reading and are very, very uh, important to the history of the specialty itself. You don't see a lot uh, that has come out of UAB in vascular surgery per se. But when we look at UAB, obviously it's a world-renowned medical center. And I think if we look back at how vascular surgery evolved uh, from, from surgery, it's, it's almost parallel with cardiac surgery. If you look back from Rudolf Matas's day, uh, how he evolved endoaneurysm morphe technique from extrapolating his experiments in general surgery, you know, we can see how the growth of both cardiac surgery and vascular surgery have been parallel, but cardiac surgery, uh, at least during the time that it was in its explosive heyday, was, was what you might call got first billing. But the development of vascular surgery here at UAB has been progressive, it's been consistent, uh, and perhaps a little bit overshadowed, at least during my tenure here. It's also important to understand the setting of the coming of age of vascular surgery here in Birmingham. And I think that's a, a very, very 
uh, interesting historical point to, to realize. The social unrest, uh, civil rights in the 1960s was when a lot of this was taking place. And it's not about what's happening nationally in Washington. It's not about the Vietnam War. These things were happening right here in Birmingham. Many of you in this room uh, who've lived in Birmingham all these years probably witnessed this firsthand. At the time, surgery was coming out of its practice limited to skin and contents uh, dynamic, and both vascular surgery and cardiac surgery could really be considered infantile in terms of their growth and development compared to where they are today. So with that, let's look at some of the principal players involved, the first of whom is Champ Lyons. Uh, I'm sure that name is very, very familiar to everybody. I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with Champ. Uh, he was born Benjamin Champney's Atley in 1907, and at age three his parents got divorced and his mother remarried Joseph Henry Lyons. He's an attorney in Mobile, and Champ grew up in Mobile. And his uncle by marriage was Luther L. Hill, uh, the first American to successfully suture a wound to the heart on a kitchen table uh, in Montgomery. Champ graduated from the University in Tuscaloosa. He went to Harvard Medical School and then did his surgery training at the Massachusetts General Hospital under Ed Churchill. He stayed there on the faculty with a primary interest in microbiology and infection. He developed this interest while he was in medical school. In 1939, he was uh, certified by the American Board of Surgery and his certificate is downstairs in the Champ Lyons room and it's signed by the original American Board of Surgery uh, uh, directors. Champ was intimately involved in the care of the patients of the infamous 1942 Coconut Road nightclub fire. Uh, Francis Moore was involved in this work with him, and in 1943 they published the results of that uh, in, uh, in a publication titled Problems of Infection in Chemotherapy, chemotherapy being antibiotic therapy. In World War II, Champ initially served as a consultant he worked at a hospital in Utah that took care of soldiers' wounds from the Pacific Theater to demonstrate the effectiveness of penicillin. Uh, and then he moved to New York and did the same thing for soldiers uh, from the Mediterranean Theater. Then he enlisted, uh, or joined, he rose to the rank of major, and he served with Edward Churchill again in the Mediterranean Theater. And for their work over there, he received the Legion of Merit. And in 1946, they published their work with penicillin uh, and soldiers' wounds from the Mediterranean theater um, and their success with that. Well, after the war, Champ was discharged with a bout of hepatitis. And he went turned to Mobile, didn't have a job, had hepatitis. Uh, those of us who are older probably had these ups and downs in your career. That's probably a down in his career. Uh, but his friend, Mike DeBakey, arranged a meeting with Alton Oxford. And this is the letter, and I apologize for you not being able to see it, but this is the letter that Alton Oxner wrote uh, Champ Lyons, and I'd just like to read a couple of paragraphs. Dear Champ, I had a letter from Mike the other day in which he said that you had been ill, that you had been discharged from the Army. I'm awfully sorry that you've been ill and hope that you are all right now. The other part of Mike's letter, which pleased me a great deal, was that you had a yearning to come back south again. I knew that you were from the south, but did not know that you wanted to come back. Mike even said that you had toyed with the idea of going to Mobile to practice. If there's any chance of you moving south, we certainly want to have first priority on you, and if you have any thoughts of leaving Boston, I wish that you would come down and visit us so that we can discuss it. I certainly would not want to take you away from MGH if you're planning on staying there. On the other hand, if you have a yen to come south, the place you ought to be is New Orleans. I should very much like to have you come down and visit with us before you make any decision. I should appreciate you letting me know at your earliest convenience, of course, uh, without any commitment. Again, I want to say I sincerely hope that you are feeling better. Boy, that's a heck of an invitation to get a job, and it helps to have friends in high places, especially those two guys. So Champ joined the Oxner Clinic and became a, on the, uh, joined the clinical faculty at Tulane, had a very productive five years of academic surgery. And that's a picture of Champ during his Oxford year. Now, in 1950, Champ was contacted by Roy Cracky. Dean Cracky called him, or wrote him actually, 
and wanted to know if he would be interested in coming to Birmingham. And after Champ's death, the Montgomery Advertiser printed the analogy that Champ Lyons returning to the state of Alabama was like Bear Bryant coming to Tuscaloosa from uh, <laughs> Texas A&M. And that had, been that, that had been floating around loosely for several years, but I couldn't pinpoint true faults and it did actually happen. And Champ's son, Judge Lyons, down in Point Clear, told me that that's where that came from. But it was indeed printed in Montgomery Advertiser. So in 19, January of 1950, Champ became the full, first full-time professor and chairman of the Department of Surgery and the first full-time faculty member since the school had moved over from Tuscaloosa. In 1950, Tinsley Harrison joined the faculty and Alfred Blaylock wrote Tinsley Harrison a letter. Tinsley was kind of, I guess, scouting out the prospects here in Birmingham and said, Champ Lyons is a grand fellow and I would think that you and he would work very nicely together. And that seems to be a pretty good job recommendation from Alfred Blaylock. So Tinsley Harrison came and joined the faculty, and these two guys would stay here for the remainders of their career. Interesting to think that Dean Cracky brought both of these people here, was responsible for bringing them both together, and he died about six months after that at age 52 of a heart attack. Now, in July of 1952, Champ was building the department here, and he brought Sterling Edwards. Uh, Sterling was a Birmingham native. He had trained at the Massachusetts, uh, at the NGA, and his interests were in vascular and cardiac surgery. And not unusual for that time, uh, Sterling went and visited different places to see what they were doing and see if we could come back, uh, bring it back here to Birmingham and what we could do. And he went to the Mayo Clinic and visited with John Kirkland and Albert Starr in Oregon and Mike DeBakey down in Baylor. And that's a picture of Sterling in those early years here at, at UAB. Now, the, in terms of vascular grass, I think most everybody that has anything to do with surgery has probably heard of the story of, of Mike DeBakey making the first Dacron graft uh, when his wife's sewing machine. He went and asked for nylon, they didn't have any, so he got Dacron, sewed it, and the rest is history. But the first nylon graph, uh, it's kind of a real historical footnote, developed right here uh, in Alabama. And nylon would subsequently prove you know, not to be useful for prosthetic vascular grafts because of loss of tensile strength and aneurysm formation, this kind of thing. But in April of 1954, Edwards had gone to the meeting of the American Surgical Association, heard Dr. Voorhees' report on Vignon N. Claw. And he partnered with uh, James Tapp, is a, a PhD at the Chemstrand Corporation in Decatur. <coughs> Chemstrand was a synthetic textile uh, company. It was a, a subsidiary of Monsanto and American Viscose, and they had a huge Acroland uh, production and research and development plant in Decatur. They chose nylon because nylon had a good track record with airplane and automobile tires, and they knew a lot about how to chemically modify nylon. So this led to a patenting of a nylon graft, a crimp nylon graft, in May of 1955. And interestingly, one of the first modifications those two guys made on it was to put a silicone coating on it for hemostasis. And that's something that came uh, on just about every vascular graft, but it wasn't until the 1990s that that happened, and they were doing it back in the 50s. That's the Chemstrand Corporation indicator uh, in the early 1950s. And that's from the uh, patent application for the graph uh, that was awarded to the Chemstrand Corporation. You can see the, the crimping uh, flexible nylon tube, <coughs> and that's how they prepared it and crimped it and made it ready for use. So here's Sterling with his new nylon graph, got his game clothes on, uh, getting ready to think about how can we use this, and that opportunity came on October the 13th, 1954. Sterling was repairing a chronic femoral AV fistula from an old traumatic injury, and during, that, during the course of the operation, the arterial clamp somehow got involved with an arteriosclerotic clamp, and before they knew it, they had, a irrever they had sustained irreversible damage to the common femoral bifurcation uh, leaving a five centimeter gap in the artery. So they put their nylon graft into the gap in an interposition fashion uh, 
and it worked really, really well. The patient did well, and they wrote this up uh, in surgery in 1955. So in the 1950s, lines uh, continued to build the academic part, uh, department. Edwards focused on cardiac and vascular surgery. In fact, Edwards had performed the first open heart procedure in July of 1954. Now, Champ Lyons became certified by the American Board of Thoracic Surgery in 1956. And about that time, him and Garber Galbraith, who was a professor of neurosurgery, uh, developed a new treatment for carotid artery disease. And that involved a, uh, a bypass procedure that uh, they thought would really benefit patients at risk for stroke. And it involved taking the aforementioned Edwards Tap Nylon Graft and doing a subclavian to carotid artery bypass beyond the area of obstruction. The anastomoses were done with oiled silk and the ends of the graft were heat sealed. And Martin Dalton was a medical student here at that time. Martin, has, uh, he's a retired cardiovascular surgeon now, lives in Macon, Georgia, I believe. Uh, had written, has written an autobiography, I mean, a written a biography of Champ Lyons, that is excellent. But he was a medical student at the time, scrubbed on several of these cases, uh, and called the operation excellent. In April of 1957, uh, Champ and Garber Galbert presented this information, report of six cases, to the Alabama Medical Association. They had 500 doctors attending uh, in Mobile. And they made a concerted effort to disseminate this type of information throughout the state. And in May of 1957, Champ also attended the American Surgical Association meeting and he presented the same six cases. The paper uh, at the American Surgical Association was discussed very favorably by Mike Bacon, who commended Champ for recognizing a very important form uh, of occlusive disease. This is the publication uh, of that in the Journal of the State Medical Association. And this is uh, from the Annals of Surgery uh, from the American Surgical Association presentation. Now, Joseph Pierce Trotter, as we knew JP, was a civil engineer from Mobile. Uh, he'd had a, a career with the Alabama Department of Transportation de de designing and building bridges before he went into the private sector. But he was referred to Champ from his doctor in Mobile with a two to three year history of left eye blindness and transient hand and uh, arm numbness. And he was given two options. You can stay here in Mobile and be anticoagulated, or you can go to Birmingham and have a new experimental operation. Well, JP and his wife chose to go to Birmingham, and he was seen by Champ. Uh, Champ noted that he had claudication of left middle cerebral artery. Galbraith described it as classical symptoms of left carotid insufficiency. Kinsley Harrison did it was his medical consultant, and on May 6, 1957, he underwent a, a left carotid arteriogram, which noted a few millimeter, quote unquote, uh, stenosis of his proximal internal carotid artery. And he had a left carotid subclavian, or left subclavian carotid bypass. And he was Champ's seventh patient. He did pretty well. After surgery, this is the admit note, and Champ writing here had claudication of the left middle cerebral artery, and then Garber Galbraith noted that he had classical symptoms of left carotid insufficiency. This is the op note, uh, and I apologize you can't read it, but if you can see this right here, that's Dr. Trotter. That's not me. That's not any of my relatives. All of my people were from Southeast Alabama. Most of them with sharecropping background. But this guy is Bob Trotter, and he finished the program in 19, uh, he was a third year resident here, finished the program under lines, and had a long career in Athens, Tennessee as a general surgeon. He died in November of uh, 2008, but he always talked real, I talked to his son, he always talked real highly uh, of Champ. He did well post-operatively, the night of surgery, Champ noted he was doing well, and then he was discharged. Uh, after about 10 days. He had some urinary retention post-op, uh, but he took estrogens for arterial healing. He went back to Mobile, he went and returned to work. He designed the Perdido Pass Bridge. He had actually begun that project before his operation while he was having TIA. And when he got through, he went back and they finished that bridge. 
But in 1960, before the actual construction was finished, he had a massive stroke. Uh, he was treated in Mobile. He had a right hemiplegia and near aphasia. But he would live another 20 years, but was always completely and permanently disabled. The records, we don't know how he was treated, because after 22 years, the records at the Mobile Infirmary uh, are destroyed. That's the bridge that, that he built during the course of this carotid insufficiency TIA business. That's the bridge I remember growing up with and fishing. And this is a bridge as it is today. Uh, talking to the son of his engineering partner, who was in college at the time, and helped him do the surveying for that bridge, there was nothing over there but uh, rattlesnakes and dummy bombs from the Pensacola Navy Station. And that land was all for sale for a dollar and eight. But I really believe that the pioneering efforts in the surgical treatment for carotid artery disease, at least in this bridge engineer, who's my great uncle, uh, allowed his continued development, involvement in the design and development uh, of the Perdido Pass Bridge. Now, between 1957 and 1960, the department continued to be productive in the arena of vascular surgery. They wrote papers on uh, dental aortic aneurysms, vena cable thrombosis, vascular trauma, aortoiliac occlusive disease, portal hypertension, uh, arteriography, and thoracic aneurysm. And many of these findings, if you read these papers, if you have an interest in reading what they thought 30, 40, 50 years ago, many of the findings really parallel with a lot of the things that we do today. In 1960, uh, Lyons became a member of the Society for Vascular Surgery. And also during this time, cardio, cardiac surgery and vascular surgery both grew in parallel. Uh, Lyons continued in a consulting capacity with the military. Uh, he was appointed by President Eisenhower as a, uh, on the Board of Regents of the National Library of Medicine. And the L.L. Hill Heart Surgery Center uh, was opened here in Birmingham, not in, uh, in large part due to Champ's relationship with his cousin, Senator uh, Lister Hill. And the Department of Surgery was beginning to gain national prominence. <clears throat> now, Holt McDowell was a native of Birmingham. Holt's father was the longest term sheriff in Jefferson County and remains that way to this day. He graduated from the University of Alabama, the Medical College of Alabama. He trained here at uh, University Hospital Underline. And in 1963, he was a chief resident. And if you'll, 1963 seems to be kind of a magic historical year. And I don't know how many of you were listening to NPR yesterday on your drive into work, but Condoleezza Rice gave an interview of, of a new book that she's just written. And she talks about 1963 and what it was like to be a young black female in Birmingham, because that's where she was from before they moved uh, out west. And I think it's worthwhile, if you'll give me five minutes to kind of digress, and I want to try to put a face, at least, you know, I was eight years old at the time, but I want to try to put a face on what this must have been like in Birmingham while these guys were doing this kind of work here at UAB. The civil rights turmoil was at its peak. The 16th Street Baptist uh, Church bombing had occurred in which four little girls were killed. Lyons and McDowell went over to the site and toured it together. And Lyons made the comment that it was worse than anything he had seen in World War II. George Wallace had begun uh, his term as governor in January of that year. Most people remember, if you're of age, the stand at the schoolhouse door. This is the aftermath of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. But most people remember Birmingham in this fashion. I knew people that had moved to Birmingham from other parts of the country. I knew people that had moved to Birmingham from foreign countries. And when you ask them or talk to them, what, what do you remember before you came here? What do you know about Birmingham? Dogs and rocks. That's what we knew. But I want to put a face on that. <clears throat> And the faces of this guy, and this guy's name is Ace Carter, Azer Earl Carter. He was born in Anniston, Alabama. He was a Navy veteran in World War II. He studied journalism at the University of Colorado right after World War II. And then there's a, there's a, a big gap. But he surfaced in the early 1970s in Sweetwater, Texas as an author. He called himself Bedford Forrest Carter, and he wrote a book called The Rebel Outlaw Josie Wales that became a movie called The Outlaw Josie Wales Start Clint Eastwood. 
He also wrote a, a book called The Education of Little Tree that received critical acclaim. It was, for a while, it was in Oprah's book club. But I want to focus for just a few minutes on those two question marks, and let's see the, the face of what was going on here in Birmingham. Well, he worked at the WILD radio, which was owned by the American States Right Association. He was a member of the North Alabama Citizens Council. He ran a gas station. He was a spokesman for segregation. He ran against Bull Connor for police commissioner and laws. And he started an outfit called the Ku Klux Klan of the Confederacy. He started a, a white supremacist newspaper. He was involved, or members of his organization were involved in the attack on Nat King Cole in 1956. In 1958, he quit that outfit, shot two of the members. The charges were dropped. In 1958, he ran for lieutenant governor and lost. In the 1960s, he was a speechwriter for George Wallace. He wrote the statement, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Wallace never acknowledged Carter workforce. And in 1970, he had a falling out with the Wallace group, ran for governor and lost. But I think when I look at this and I look at, at the, what the climate must have been like, you've got this major academic medical center in which these issues play no role in training doctors, training surgeons, uh, and certainly treating patients. But yet, here they were doing this kind of work, and, and growing this <coughs> world-class medical center, and this is the face that I like to put on. That's Ace when he was at the radio station. That's Ace when he was the famous author of uh, Josie Wales. So in 1963, the emergency rooms at University Hospital were segregated. And Lyons recognized how inappropriate this was to ask Alan Demick uh, when Alan finished the residency uh, with combining and desegregating the emergency rooms. And this was remarkable in that it was accomplished during a period of martial law here in Birmingham. But more importantly, was Sterling Edwards. I think a lot of people are, are aware or have at least seen the movie uh, Something the Lord Made, which details a relationship between Alfred Blaylock and his African-American uh, lab assistant, Vivian Thomas. They worked at Johns Hopkins together for 34 years. But I think what a lot of people don't recognize is Sterling Edwards did the same thing with Clarence Forrest here for 17 years. When Sterling developed the cardiovascular research lab, he went to uh, one of the local high schools and he needed to find an individual who was academically talented but would not have the means to further his education and Clarence was introduced to him, he was hired him. And in fact, in the summer of 1963, in the midst of everything that we've just seen, uh, the Wall Street Journal did an article on that relationship. And thanks to Tim Pennycuff, we have a copy of that article now in the archives. Uh, called, it's, the article's titled, The Birmingham Story. Uh, Birmingham was characterized as riots, bombs, dogs, and hoses. Edwards was characterized as a privileged suburb. Forrest was characterized as descended from slaves, but the article concludes with University Hospital's cardiovascular research unit is said to be unsurpassed anywhere in the Deep South. Uh, and it was a very, very complimenting article. And if anybody has the time or the interest, I really encourage you to read it. By 1964, uh, carotid arterectomy had replaced the carotid subclavian bypass for carotid artery disease. And Lyons and McDowell were beginning to collaborate uh, on this topic and be published. And this is one of the first papers that they published uh, together uh, in terms of carotid endarterectomy. This is a picture of uh, Champ and Holt operating together. It looks like a, a, by an open heart operation because of the tube. There's Champ and there's Holt. Champ continued to get accolades. He was a distinguished professor at the University of Alabama. He was a distinguished faculty lecturer of the medical center and he was the first Charles and Faye Kerner Chair of Surgery. The distinguished faculty lecture that year was this article that was published in the Alabama Journal of Medical Sciences. And this is probably my favorite article of all of this because if you read this article and look at what I was taught uh, during my tenure here for carotid arterectomy, this is pretty much the template that served uh, for that operation probably during the 70s, 80s, and from what I understand, uh, into the 90s. Champ had about 90 publications in Birmingham, 
about half of which were cardiovascular related. And in July of 1965, the residents and his son noticed a left facial weakness. The brain scan confirmed a left cerebral lesion. And Garber Galbraith did a craniotomy on him in 1960, in August. Uh, he had an unresectable brain tumor. He died on October the 24th at age 58. And that's the picture that most everybody uh, is familiar with at Champs, his best known photograph uh, here at the University. Now his legacy is basically <coughs> two from a medical standpoint, penicillin in World War II and, and early adventures in carotid artery surgery. But if you look around here, there's a, uh, a real legacy, the Lyons Harrison Research Building, uh, the Lyons Room downstairs here in the Lister Hill Library that has many of his documents and books. Uh, when I was here, there was a Champ Lyons House Staff Memorial Hospital on the first floor of the University Hospital outside the cafeteria. It's a great place to hide until you find out you couldn't hide anyway as a surgeon. Resident. There's a Champ Lyons lecture at the School of Medicine and uh, the Dr. Champ Lyons endowed chair uh, in general surgery that, if I'm not mistaken, is currently held by Dr. Uris. In 1966, the search committee uh, located John Kirkland, and Dr. Kirkland came and expanded all aspects of the program, initially encompassing uh, general vascular cardiothoracic surgery before compartmentalizing everything, and of course developed a premier cardiac surgery program. Sterling Edwards went to the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque in 1969. He built a cardiovascular surgery program there. He became chairman of the department there in 1974, and he retired in 1987. He died in 2004 at the age of 84. And that's a picture of Sterling uh, shortly after his retirement. Sterling served the specialty of vascular surgery very well. He was president of the SVS, Society for Vascular Surgery, in 1970. He was president of the what was then the North American chapter of the International Society for Cardiovascular Surgery that subsequently became the American Association of Vascular Surgery that has now merged with the Society of Vascular Surgery. In 1987, he was president of the uh, Western Vascular Society. There's a Sterling Edwards Endowed Professorship at the University of New Mexico. And here at UAB, the Multimodality Imaging Labs, part of the Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, is named after him. In 1974, he authored a biography of Alexis Carell. Now, Hope McDowell had always been profoundly influenced by Champ Lyons. I never knew why, and the, the people of my generation that talked to Hope never really knew why. I, I found some of the answers when I talked to uh, Champ's son, Champ Jr., who him and Holt, or he and Holt were good friends. Uh, the story goes that Champ Jr. came up here one day to watch his dad operate, and uh, he, I think he was at, at Harvard at the time, and he was home on break, and he went in to watch him operate, and for first sight of blood, he was on the floor. They woke him up in the hall. He went back to school the next week and switched his med from uh, his major from pre-med to political science. <clears throat> but Holt, uh, Champ told me that when Sheriff McDowell, during the last days of his life, he was hospitalized here for a rather prolonged period. And during that time, Champ was extraordinarily kind to Holt. Uh, take it for what it means, but I think most of us can imagine what that would mean as a, uh, a surgery resident uh, to have that kind of consideration shown to him. I think Holt always remembered that. But he remained on the faculty, and I think it's very reasonable to say that he established a standard of care for vascular surgery at that time at UAB. And that's Holt in his uh, early days, certainly before I knew him. And not, he rose through the ranks. He was an instructor of surgery in 1963, became assistant professor, associate professor in 1980, professor of surgery. Holt would spend his entire 36th career here in Birmingham, here at UAB. And the only medical license Holt ever held was Alabama. His interests were primarily clinical and teaching. At the time, vascular surgery was a very integral component of general surgery. Uh, most of his 50 plus publica plus publications involved carotid artery surgery in some fashion. He continued to collaborate with the Department of Neurosurgery in this regard, and they would uh, 
periodically report their results primarily to patients, I mean to uh, physicians here in the state. <coughs> He led and embodied the vascular surgery experience here at UAB. We also, at the time, uh, red surgery was what we call McDowell surgery. It was staffed by Holt and Gil Needham. They shared staffing. As you know, Gil's primary interest was, was renal transplant, uh, but there was a vascular access service that spun off the renal transplant service from which we gained some experience. But the heart and soul of vascular surgery at UAB was McDowell and red surgery. This was primarily done at University Hospital and the VA on red surgery and purple surgery, the names of which uh, were taken from the, the Mayo Clinic paradigm template, if you will, that John Kirkland brought in. We also gained experience at Cooper Green and Lloyd Nolan. Uh, not a lot, but some, but certainly the lessons that we learned on red were translated and taken from, from red to purple and then to Cooper Green and Lloyd Nolan. And probably the, the best way to talk about Holt is to talk from a personal experience. Uh, and it, to, to ever think that these kinds of things you don't carry with you, it's been nearly 25 years since I darkened these doors. But these lessons, and when I talk to my colleagues scattered around the country, you know, we, we share, that, share that experience. Holt was called Captain Midnight. And all the surgery residents that I ever knew him called him the Captain. It was the captain this or the captain that or what's the captain doing or where is the captain, what's the captain want me to do. And he, he supposedly got that nickname uh, because he liked to round at midnight. And he said, why would he want to round at midnight and answer that question so he wouldn't have to talk to the families. So uh, things have certainly changed. Holt didn't have a lot of patience. But the experience as a chief resident on his service was a rite of passage. He started his cases at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, after the hubbub of 7, 7.15, uh, Holt would be sitting typically in his office with his feet on his desk smoking a cigarette and working crossword puzzles. And he would come in and the cases would start, typically major vascular cases, aortic cases first, stem pops, carotid second, amputations and general surgery cases at the end of the day. And suffice to say that at some point during a lot of these cases, uh, Holt would have a tendency to get frustrated a little bit. And when he would, he would kind of get wound up and he would tell the chief resident across the table and kind of mumble to dry it up and I'll be back. And he would take a little break. About 20 minutes later, he'd come back. He had to stand back to get a whiff of the nicotine. And then, very calmly, the case would, 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 complete, would go to a rapid conclusion. But he really taught a lot and the lessons are, are truly life lessons for surgeons. One of the things he taught you how to do was take control of a situation uh, and an operating room. And, and there's no better example of that than being with Holt when he was in the throes of a ruptured aneurysm. He took control of the aneurysm uh, and took control of the operating room. And, and anecdotally, to the best of my recollection, it was not infrequently that he won. Uh, his technique for carotid endarterectomy served a lot of us well over the years, selective shunning, EEG monitoring. Uh, the nuances of prosthetic grass, very straightforward clamping and declamping sequences. He tended to save sap in his vein for future cabbages, which at the time seemed to be reasonable. Uh, a lot of people don't do that very much anymore. I don't do it much anymore, but it certainly was a reasonable thing. In terms of new technology, Tolt made the comment, I like to put my money on the dogs I've seen run. And about that time, the vascular lab was coming into being, and Tolt believed in that dog. And he started that, uh, and I think uh, Willa told me that he kept it up until just about the time he retired. When he made rounds, he, it, it, by the end of my residency, Holt was rounding much earlier in the day. I, I, as a junior resident, I experienced the cat midnight, and as a chief, I experienced the four o'clock, so I had the full gamut. But he'd walk into the room very nicely, keep talking, and never stop. Walk in, turn around. So one day I, grabbed, I, I said, you know, I really, I really admire that technique. He just looked at me and said, I've talked to my man, and that's your turn. His referral pattern was statewide, and he seemed to know just about <coughs> everybody in Birmingham uh, and the state. His clinical judgment was probably the most important lesson that we learned from him. And this quote comes from a Saturday morning m, &M conference. Uh, 
when a, a question had arisen as to why did you do what you did. And Holt got up and said, well, I didn't know what was wrong with her, but she had that look on her face that said, I'm going to die if you don't do something. And so therein lies the reason for whatever was done. Uh, you learn confidence in your decision-making ability. And his philosophy with regard to malpractice was really timely. Kind of understated, but if there's one thing I understand, it's money. He often said that surgeons were the conscience of the hospital. And what he meant by that was, was typically in a big university medical center with multiple services, it's not unusual to when things have been done for the patient, most clinical or therapeutic uh, interventions have been tried and failed, typically in the middle of the night when there's nobody else to call, they typically would call the surgeons. He transitioned vascular surgery as it evolved from general surgery into its own subspecialty. He retired in 1999 and Holt died in 2005 at age 74. And I think the tribute to Holt is the establishment of the Holt McDowell Endowed Chair of Vascular Surgery is a very, very fitting tribute that was made to him by uh, patients and but legions of, of residents and trainees that had served under him. And that's a picture of Holt in uh, kind of later years. That pretty much personifies Holt as I knew him. And today, Will Jordan is, is the uh, chief of vascular surgery. It's, a, it's its own section in the Department of Surgery. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Champ and Holt both would be very, very proud. So I think <clears throat> my conclusions in, in this little adventure were, were two. One was the pioneering efforts in the development and evolution of vascular surgery here at UAB were steadily progressive through an era of very, very profound historical events. And these events were both social in terms of the civil rights era and medical, which is the explosive growth of cardiac surgery, both of which Birmingham was on the front line. And I also think that national recognition of UAB and vascular surgery uh, actually predated that of cardiac surgery, but was probably overshadowed by that until recent years when dynamic changes in technology and innovation and information supported the reemergence. And I think that's pretty much uh, where we stand today. And I think that's a, a, a fair conclusion. There are several people involved in putting this project together. I want to thank each and every one of them. Uh, it, was a, it was just a whole lot of fun doing it. It's almost like a connect the dot uh, treasure hunt, but it was real, it was real privilege for me uh, to be able to do it. It was even more of a privilege to be here today with you and share this information. I'd be glad to answer any questions.